Hey, this is Sesh. Welcome or welcome back to the second of a pair of videos on Depth First Search or DFS for graphs. In the first part, you saw how the DFS algorithm works on directed and undirected graphs and how to derive its running time. Now you will see how to implement the DFS algorithm in Java on graphs that are stored in adjacency linked lists, a storage scheme that was covered in a separate video. Let's begin with a quick recap of the DFS algorithm's central idea from which the implementation emerges quite naturally. As the name suggests, depth first search starts at some vertex in the graph and proceeding along a sequence of edges goes as deep as it can until it hits a dead end, at which point it starts backtracking until it encounters a vertex off of which it can take another path down the graph. So for example, in this graph, if DFS were to start at A, it has a choice of B or C to visit next. If it were to pick B, and this choice is arbitrary, it would then go all the way down to F. Having hit a dead end, it would backtrack all the way to A, at which point it would take off in the direction of C. Here, it can only proceed as far as C, because at C, it is discovered that the next neighbor, D, has already been visited. Taking the next step to D would result in retreading the entire DEF path, which would be redundant. So effectively, C is a dead end, at which point backing up to A would end the DFS since there is no other path to take from A. The clue to implementation is in the backtracking. This happens automatically in the sense that it is not via an edge, but rather due to recall by the program itself as to which vertex it had most recently visited. Reversing a trail without explicitly storing breadcrumbs in the program is the essence of recursion, and so DFS is implemented using recursion. I'm going to start with the essential pieces, showing you how the recursion works with the adjacency linked list storage. Then I'll add in the surrounding code and demo its execution in Eclipse. First, let's review the adjacency linked list storage scheme on our example graph. In a sense, the scheme is an array of linked lists. Each place in the array corresponds to a vertex in the graph, and off of that place is a linked list of its neighbors. There may be some variation in the details of the actual objects used. What follows is one interpretation of the sense. The array has six places for the six vertices. The vertices are numbered 0 through 5. The numbering is arbitrary in that any vertex could get any number between 0 and 5. Here, I have chosen to number the vertices in alphabetical order for ease of correlating. Now, in each place in the array, I have chosen to store an object of class vertex that I define like this. The name field is the name of the vertex, and the edge list field is a reference to a neighbor object, which is a linked list node. The node has two fields, vertex num, which is the array index number of the neighbor vertex, and next, which is the pointer to the next neighbor in the list. Note that the array location where a vertex is stored serves as its number. So the vertex number is just a means to index into the array to get its info, and there is no implication beyond this for the algorithm. So back in the vertex object, the edge list field is a pointer to the first neighbor, which is the first node in the adjacency linked list of neighboring vertices. Just as the assignment of numbers to vertices is arbitrary, so is the sequence in which the neighbors of a vertex are stored in its adjacency linked list. So, for instance, the neighbors of A here are stored in alphabetical order, with B first, then C, but it could well have been C first, then B. It would make no difference in the outcome of any of the algorithms applied on the graph. And finally, there is a graph class with a field called edge lists that refers to the graph's adjacency linked lists array. Okay, we're all set up to dive into the algorithm. We have to implement a recursive method in the graph class with the DFS starting at some vertex. Here's the header. But we also need to mark vertices as visited and a Boolean array indexed by vertex number would work well for this. So this needs to be passed along as a parameter for every recursive call as the algorithm proceeds to the graph which changes the header to this. Now, inside the method, as soon as we get to this vertex, we will mark it as visited. By setting to true, the value in the visited array 
indexed by this vertex number v. The actual task done when visiting a vertex would depend on the graph application that uses DFS. For purpose of illustration, let's just output the vertex name when we visit it. The name is obtained by referencing the adjacency lists array using the vertex number as index, which gives the vertex object at that location, whose name field is the name of the vertex. The next thing we want to do at the vertex is to launch recursive DFS on each of its neighbors, only if that neighbor has not already been visited. Since we need to go through all the neighbors, we need to loop to the adjacency linked list. A pointer called NBR is used to track through the linked list, initially set to the first neighbor of the vertex, which is referenced through the edge list field of the vertex object. The loop spins until the NBR pointer hits null, advancing to the next neighbor in every iteration. For the current neighbor, we first need to check its visited flag and only call DFS recursively on it if it's not already visited. Again, for purpose of illustration, so that we can follow along when we execute DFS and sample graphs, I'm going to throw in a print statement that will output the edge between this vertex and its neighbor. And that finishes up the DFS recursive method. Let's trace the execution of this code on our example graph. Initially, the visited array contains all false values. DFS starts at A, visits it, sets the visited array value at index 0 to true. Then it starts iterating over A's neighbors. The first neighbor is vertex number 1, which is B, which has not been visited, so DFS proceeds to B. Note that the iteration of neighbors of A is on hold and will proceed when DFS eventually backtracks to A. B is visited, and iteration over its neighbor starts up, resulting in proceeding to the vertex number 3, which is D. D is visited, and its neighbor E is taken up next. E is visited, and its neighbor F is the next candidate. DFS proceeds to F and visits it. But F has no neighbors, and a dead end is reached. The DFS backs up to E. There are no more neighbors in E, so back up to D. No more neighbors, back up to B. No more neighbors once again, back up to A. At this point, the iteration over the neighbors of A resumes, proceeding to C, which is then visited. C's neighbor D is examined and found to be already visited. So back to A again. And now, there are no more neighbors of A, so DFS comes to a halt. All vertices have been visited. Okay, we have a recursive implementation of DFS starting at some vertex. But it's not quite complete yet. What if there are vertices that can't be reached from the starting vertex? In that case, we will need to restart DFS, possibly multiple times, to ensure that all vertices are reached. For instance, if we started at C instead of A in this graph, vertices C, D, and E will be covered. A restart will need to be done from either A or B, the unvisited vertices. If the restart happens from B, then A is still not reached. So another restart will have to be done from A, at which point all vertices would have been covered. What this means for the code is we need another piece that will restart DFS as needed by calling the recursive DFS method on the restart vertex. Let's call this piece the driver. Since a restart will have to be done whenever there are unvisited vertices, the driver will need to scan the visited array. When it comes across a cell with a false value in it, it should call the DFS method with the index of the cell as the vertex number, which implies the following code. Say the graph is stored like this, with vertex numbering in the order C, B, A, D, and E. The visited array starts with false values in all the cells. The driver scans the visited array, finds that the first cell is false, and initiates a call to DFS with number 0, which is vertex C. When the DFS call returns, the visited array has changed to this, since C, D, and E would have been visited. The driver goes on to the next cell, 1, sees a false value, and calls DFS on vertex number 1, which is B. That DFS returns, having only visited B, updating the visited array to this. Again, the driver goes to the next cell, 2, spots a false, and calls DFS on 2, for vertex A, 
When the call returns having visited A, the visited array is updated to this. The driver continues scanning through the end of the visited array, does not see any other falses, and terminates, which brings the entire DFS process to an end. There is one last loose end that we need to tie in the code, and that is to host the driver code in its own method. Any application that needs to run DFS on a graph should call the driver, not the recursive DFS, since the DFS process should include any and all restarts. In order to ensure that the recursive DFS is not called from outside the class, we change its access level from public to private. Also, since the DFS algorithm does not call for a particular starting vertex, an application must not supply one, so the driver method should not accept any parameters. Here's a method code publicly accessible in the graph class. Now let's look at the complete implementation and run it on a couple of graphs. Here are the neighbor and vertex classes. The graph class follows with the field edge lists that holds the array of vertex objects. The constructor reads in a graph from an input file and populates the adjacency link lists. Here's a directed graph for a website. The vertices are the pages of the website and each edge is a link from one page to another. Here's the input file representation for the graph. Notice that there is an indicator in the very first line that tells whether the graph is directed or not. The next line in the file is the number of vertices. This is followed by one vertex per line, which is then followed by one edge per line. So the constructor reads in the number of vertices, sets up the array size, reads in the vertex objects, reads in the edges, and that finishes up the populating of the adjacency link lists. Now here's the recursive DFS code, and here's the public DFS driver. Notice that I have inserted an additional line here to tell us every time a restart happens on the DFS at a new vertex. Now let's run this code on this website graph. The input file name is website. TXT. So as you can see from the output, the DFS starts at vertex page A, goes from A to E, E to F, F to D, and D to B. This basically reaches a dead end. Backtracking brings it all the way back to A and out. Then the DFS is started up at C, from where there are no unvisited vertices to go to and the DFS stops. Now let's repeat this process on, a, on an undirected graph. So here is a friendship graph. The very first line says it's undirected. There's 10 vertices. This is a list of all the vertices, followed by the list of all the edges. So let's run this. This time the input is friendship. Txt, and that's the output. The DFS starts up at the vertex zero. It basically reaches all the vertices from that point except Rahul, Sapna, and Rohit. So the DFS has to start up at one of these unvisited vertices. It starts up again at Rahul and finishes up by visiting all the remaining vertices. And that's the end of the DFS process. Which also brings us to the end of this video tutorial on DFS implementation. Hope you enjoyed it, hope you learned a lot, and I hope to see you again soon.